Almighty God, on this blessed day, we have so much to be thankful for. So inspire our service, enable us, oh God, to listen and listen well. Enlighten our minds, soften our hearts, and give us strength of limb that together we might build up your kingdom. That the words that I speak bring you praise, oh God, and never, never shame. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. The sermon for this blessed morning, building up the kingdom of God, building up the kingdom of God. One night I was watching the news and it was a special on of retired athletes, uh, retired basketball player, Charles Barkley was one of them, retired tennis player, John McEnroe was another. They were talking about using their gifts and their graces. And Charles Barkley happened to mention that he had given, he had spent or lost $10 million gambling. And it just caught John McEnroe off guard. And he said, Charles, do you realize what you could have done to help the kingdom with $10 million? And Charles said, well, I give money to charity. But he said, you lost $10 million. The text that uh, uh, Brother Myers read so ably this morning is a conversation about what God gives us and what we do with it. The landowner left town and gave his servants resources, had expectations of those resources. And when he came back, certain things he expected. Several of them did right with his resources one fearful of, of the master did nothing. Question this morning is, what does God expect of us with our gifts and graces? We are not just talking about the money God gives us, but we're created, every one of us created. And there's a roadmap in our, in our souls that God has directions for us. God gives, gives us gifts individually, gifts to match who we are. But God doesn't just give those gifts for us to put under a bushel or bury in the ground. God gives us those gifts and he expects the world to be made better. He expects us to build up his kingdom. So what do we do? I am convinced that it's easier for Christians to give God their emotion than their emotion. Christians can get so worked up, emotional. We can cry at the drop of a hat, weep, jump up and down and shout and show God our emotion. But the ones who truly understand that our gifts and graces are to be used, take, we take our emotion and join our motion and do something to make the world a better, much richer and better place. God gives us ability. If he makes you a principal of a school, he makes you a doctor, makes you a lawyer, makes you a preacher, makes you a teacher, makes you a, 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 a lay of carpet, makes you a gent, what if he makes you? He has expectations that I've gifted you. Different gifts to different folk. Don't worry about their gifts, worry about yours. What do you do with your gifts? If you are a doctor, how much of your time is spent on charitable stuff? If you are a nurse, if you are a teacher, how much time is spent in mentoring? If you are a preacher, how much time do you have spent in prayer, even with those who don't go to the church? We have expectations. If the kingdom is gonna be made better daily, we take our gifts and graces and we use them. We don't find excuses not to use them. I firmly believe that God is tired of us playing religion that just deals with emotions. That, that if we believe, if we sing enough, if we come to the building enough, then everything's okay. God has expectations of us that even when we give out food, we don't just hand food out as if we're better than the people we give it to. We hand it out and tell them, except for the grace of God, there go I. I, I could be in your situation. I'm one paycheck away from being in your situation, but I am here helping you because God has so fixed my heart. I can do it without God's 
direction. God has fixed my heart that I want to help you. I'm giving out clothes to you, not from me, my heart, but from God's heart. God has directed me to do this. If we're going to build up God's kingdom, we have to keep asking the questions, Lord, what would you have me to do? I've got my resources. I got my gifts. I've got my graces. What am I going to do with it? Arthur Ashe was probably one of my favorite. Now, some of you know that I'm just a tennis fanatic, but Arthur Ashe was a great, not just a tennis player, but a great human being. Not only did he win championships in tennis, he won championships fighting for human rights. He went to jail for apartheid in South Africa. He marched, he protested, he did what he needed to do, and he used his money to build foundations to help kids in inner cities to do stuff with his resources. He didn't need his name and lights. He didn't broadcast what he did. He just did what he did. He used his, his tennis gifts to show other kids how to play. He used his gifts to show people what God could do and can, what God could do, does do and can do. In 1975, there were expectations. The Wilmington tournament, Arthur Ashe was playing Jimmy Connors, Young, brash, probably the better player. But Arthur Ashe was spiritually prepared, physically prepared. Jimmy Connors wanted to rush the game. Arthur Ashe slowed down. Every between sets, he, he meditated. He thought. He was, he was in a contemplative mood, and it just irked Jimmy Connors. But at 1975, when all the odds makers had but heavy money on Jimmy Connors, Arthur Ashe came out the victor because he was a spiritual person, because he knew that his gifts, he knew his gifts, he knew Jimmy Connors' gifts, and he knew if he did certain things, if he just, just took his time, he was calm and at peace, then he would come out the victor. If we use our gifts the way God wants us to, we come out the victory. We come out the winner at the finishing line. If we use our gifts and graces the way God wants us to, then we do make the world a better place. If you look at what happened in the political stuff in Georgia, one woman from Mississippi, birthplace, mom and dad preachers, one woman, you know what I'm talking about, organized and organized, Stacey, Stacey Abrams, organized and organized, not because she just wanted to be governor, because she wanted justice for people who were voting. She wanted justice for poor, poor people. And she organized and she organized and they, and they talked about it and they ridiculed her and they belittled her, but she held her head high. And, and in this election, Georgia flipped, not just politics, Georgia flipped in a spiritual way. It flipped for a man of God because Stacey Abrams stood there using her gifts and graces, great lawyer. She could be a lot of things, but she served God and served God faithfully and nobody had to tell her. And even when she lost because people just didn't get up out of bed, wouldn't take the time, she lost by slim margin as governor because people wouldn't get up and support her, but she didn't stop. She kept on going and said, I am going to be a child of God no matter what other people do. And she stood firm and could raise her head high when Georgia flipped and became a, a Democratic, a, a vote for Democrats for the best men running. That's who she was. If you and I are going to build up the kingdom of God, we got to keep ask ourselves the question. I have friends who get angry with me I can see the rage in their voices when I challenge them with their resources. I challenge, I challenge them to tithe and they get angry. Nobody tells me what to do with my money. And I say, listen, it ain't your money. Tithe and money belongs to God. And even for the, all the folk in the world who don't tithe, it doesn't, I mean, I don't, they won't, don't bother me if you get mad at me. If you don't tithe, it's God's money and it's used to build up God's kingdom. So you can either do or you don't, but don't use excuses. I've heard them all. But if my mother who cleaned houses could tithe on $4 a day, those of us who make 50, 60, 70, $100,000 could give back to God, not just because we want to pay light bill at the church or we want to keep the grass cut, because we want to see ministry happen in God's kingdom. We want to build up the kingdom. Church is never about the stuff we have and the cushion pews and the air conditioning and all of all the festival stuff that we have. Church is about service. And we give our resources. 
not just our money, but our time and our talent. If we read, if we understand the vows of the church, it talks about gifts, resources, and talent. And most folk have forgotten that when you read the vows, they forgot about the money part. But you made the vow. Nobody made you make a vow to the church. Whatever your denomination, wherever you go, nobody made you, nobody made you make a vow. You made that vow. And if you choose to break that vow, whatever excuse you got, Whatever excuse you got, stand before God at the end and tell God that excuse. Don't tell me, don't tell your friends, tell it to God why you're not doing what you are called to do, why you're not visiting the sick, why you're not clothing the naked, why you're not preaching a word to those who don't have a word, why you're not loving the ones who are unlovable, why you're not talking to the prostitutes, why you're not talking to the drug addicts, why you're not talking to the pimps. If we're gonna make this kingdom a better place, then you and I know it is not about us. It is about God. I shared this with you many times when I would, my mother had gotten so sick of me talking about Oprah and what Oprah was not doing with her money. My mother finally said, son, what are you doing with you? You can't control Oprah. You can't, can, you can't control uh, the Waltons and, or, or, or if you've been living during the time of the Carnegie's and Mellon's and Vanderbilt's, you can't control those people, but what are you doing with your resources? If at the end of the day, you can say, Lord, I've done all I can do with mine, let God worry about the rest. That's God's business, that ain't your business. You do what God has called you to do. And at the end of the day, you answer for Roger Anthony Hobson. You don't answer for John or Joe or Paul or Mary. If you're gonna make the kingdom better, you do your bit. And so my challenge today is what gifts and graces has God given you? Use those gifts and graces to make the kingdom better. God did not allow you to get a PhD just because you can lift, hold it over people who don't have one. God did not allow you to reach the top of your medical field just because you could be a big shot. God did not, not allow you to become superintendents of schools because you could say, I'm the only one. God did not give us the gifts and graces so it could be about us. To whom much is given, much is required. What will you do with what God has given you? At the end of the day, will you rejoice in what you're able to give away? There's a saying that if you live in this world, you ought to give more than you take. So how open is your hand or how tight is your fist? Are you holding on the stuff so tight nothing can come in? Are you firmly believing? like the most of the world is you just got to build it up and build it up and build it up and win the red race. We retired uh, 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 the late pastor, Joe Lowry, famous for civil rights, had a wonderful saying about the red race. He said, if you win the red race at the end, you're still a rat. And too many people of us are, 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 are being rats trying to win the red race. God didn't put us on a fast track to win a red race. He put us on a fast track so you and I could be witnesses for a kingdom building, so you and I could be witnesses for the joy we feel in serving. You know, when you do something for God, it just feels so good. It just, it just God, God, you allowed me to be able to get up this morning and do voter registration. You allowed me, God, to work with the kids in basketball. You allowed me to tutor. You allowed me to go in the corner and talk to the drug addicts. You allowed me, Lord, and it feels so good. I don't know what the end product is going to be. I don't know if I'll be successful in the people I talk to, but Lord, I do know, I do know, I do know I have been faithful and that's all I want to do, Lord, is to be faithful because at the end of my journey, I just need to hear you say, say well done, that good and perfect that good and faithful servant. I don't need you to say, well done, you perfect being. I don't need you to say, well done, the person who's never done any sin. I don't need you to say that because I know it will not be true. My closet is filled with stuff I don't want anybody to know. A lot of pain and a lot of alienation, a lot of frustration. But God, you have so sealed my closet with the blood of the lamb. You seal my closet and so nobody has to know that's between me and you. Your journey starts now. When you say yes to me, it's a new day. Forget about yesterday. Leave it at the altar. Leave all the trash at the altar. Don't just pick it up. Because all of us have something that we ought to be ashamed of. But you know what? The altar, the blood of the lamb cleanses you and cleanses your slate and wipes your slate clean. So if we're going to do kingdom building, the question is, what will people say about us at the end of our journey? 
Well, they say she was a good woman. He was a good man. Every funeral I've had of the seniors of seminary, the funeral was already preached because of the life that person has lived. We buried a wonderful saint a couple of days ago, a couple of days ago, Miss Annette Stewart. And what I said at the funeral was that she represented the song by Debbie Boone, You Light Up My Life, because she was the kind of Christian who came into your space and you had your word just your word would just light up. Don't you want somebody to, to say that about you that when you came to church, when you came in at home, you brought such a blessing that the world would light up? That, that, that nobody had to ask you to be kind or good or faithful. That's just what you do. We are celebrating, and we will when we get back into church, we'll celebrate 155 years at Centenary. Seven, nearly eight generations of folk who are keep doing kingdom building. And the thing that frightens me more than anything is that each succeeding generation in any church seems to understand the legacy less and less and less. I pray that the ones of us who are gonna go on and ones who come after us at Centenary will pick up the torch and understand that to whom much is given, much is required. We'll pick that torch up and say, Lord, we don't wanna bury our resources. We wanna take our resources and double them and quadruple them and, 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 and have our resources, not just because we can pile it up because we can give it away because we can say, Lord, we have made the kingdom better with the resources you gave us. And we are so proud today. We're so grateful. We're so happy. We're satisfied, oh God, that you've made us into who you need us to be. I can never, never understand, and you hear me share this, Miss Osceola McCartney in Mississippi who walked in the University of Southern Mississippi and gave the president $150,000 $150, for scholarship. And the woman was a washer woman. She had given everything she had and when the president challenged her and said, you know, you ought to be doing something for yourself, traveling or whatever, she said, I want no other child, no other girl child, no other baby in Mississippi to have the knuckles like I got to, be, to, to have these washerwoman hands. I want that to, ha no, that to happen for nobody. And I give this greatly, I give it faithfully. I give it to make things better. Now she gave the widow's might $150,000 and there are folk there are folks still today, when they go through the line and the people ask them to give their change to round it off for St. Jude, have the audacity to say no. What are we coming to? What is the world coming to? We need to say, I will be a part of the army that makes the kingdom better. And at the end of the day, several things happen to us. Number one is we find happiness. We have joy in our souls and the storms of life can't beat us down. All the hell and all the commotion or whether it's racism, sexism, classism, it can't beat us down because we know we serve a God who owns cattle on a thousand hills. We serve a God who is faithful to us. We serve a God that says all the evil institutions will finally crumble and, and crumble. All the hate in the world finally coming in. One day the lion will lie down, the, lie down with the lamb and we shall study war no more. It brings us that unquenchable, that, 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 that peace that goes on and on, joy, happiness, and peace. And more importantly, we live in solidarity with our neighbors and say to Reverend Jones, and say to Brother Miles, and say to Sister Mayo, Brother Miles, we say to all of our folk, Brother Stewart, we say to all the folk, we are on this journey together, and we're having a blast. We're on this journey together because we got one another. We know we're going to make it because we got one another. We got somebody to lean on. We got somebody to love. We got somebody to carry us through the storm. We got somebody to be have our back. We got somebody who knows and understands that this kingdom journey is more than about emotion, it's about motion. Where we go from here? Yes, I get so filled up, I can cry, I can jump, I can shout, but if that's all I do, then I wasted God's time. 
if my jumping and shouting and crying moves me to do something, then I'm in line with God's own kingdom and his own building. So the challenge for you this day, as you think about kingdom building, do you want that joy? Do you want that peace? Do you want that love? If so, stop making excuses for what you haven't done and give thanks to God for what you are doing and promise and pledge to God that you will do more and more and more while you have the strength, while you have the ability, while you have the sameness of your mind, while you have the strength of your limb and while you are able. And when a day comes when you can no longer be able, you'll have sweet, tender memories, wonderful memories of the journey that you've been on, the love that you gave, the love that was given to you. And you can say, Lord, it's been a mighty good day. You can say, Lord, it's been an awesome journey. You can say, Lord, I just, I just want to thank you. I've got a good friend, Christy, born in a white woman, born in the South, grew up in a time of racism, always a fighter of justice. And just last week when I called her to see how she was doing, last week, one week ago in Nashville, we were laughing and talking and then she just started screaming and hollering and get, get away from me. I thought a dog or something had gotten her. She screamed and yelled and hung up. And when I finally got her back, she said some young boys had tried to take her phone, but she was okay. The police were there and they were looking for him and she was, had calmed down. And I told Cynthia, I said, I'm gonna call her back. And I called her back and I said, Christy, were those black kids? And she said, yeah. I said, you know, I'm gonna tell you something about your journey and who you are. And I give thanks to God for your journey. You never mentioned to me when you talked to me, these kids had tried to take these black kids. I said, 99% of the people, black, white, or Hispanic, would have talked about the race of those kids. You never mentioned it. Because part of your DNA says it doesn't matter what color they are. Their kids, she was talking about how much she just wanted to see them and hug them and wanted to change their lives. Who does that except the Christian who has made his or her peace with God on this journey and are making it willing to make the kingdom better? She did not care about those being black kids. She was just so hurt that they needed, it was so desperate they needed to grab her phone or they, or, or they didn't have anybody to help them or love them. She just wanted to reach out and love them. Well, what a witness. It didn't matter that they were black kids. Kids are kids. Could have been Hispanic, could have been white. Whatever the situation, you'll find kids who do that. She says, we've got to make the world better so they want, that won't happen. What will you do? When will you do it? And are you willing? to build up the kingdom, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, so much is happening and we desperately need to be about building up your kingdom. Help us, oh Lord, to see one another who we truly are, just people with flesh and blood who have the same hopes and dreams and teach us to just see beyond skin color or anything else and to love people. We pray that those who are uh, listening to me today on Facebook, if you have a need to join our family to help build up the kingdom of God, the, we, we have ways for you to contact us. You can call me, the pastor, call our church at Centenary, and I'd met this church and we can help you and guide you and direct your spiritual journey from their own. And for those who are listening, uh, who will be with us doing our glory sightings, you can also do the same thing. But we give thanks to God for this day and for our journey. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.